by the Lord and very thankful for that. We'll turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And as you turn there, I want to tell you a little story from April or spring of 1865. So Robert E. Lee and the Confederacy surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse April 9th, 1865. And even though the leaders of the Confederacy, as we know, came to Danville for a week, the Civil War was basically over when Lee surrendered. But there were still lots of hurt feelings and confusion about what to do next. So a little bit later in the spring, at St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Richmond, Virginia, something happened that had never happened before, and the pastor, Pastor Charles Minogerode, didn't know what to do. I'm sure I got that name wrong, uh, but Pastor Charles didn't know what to do. You see, in Episcopal churches, a point is reached in the service where people come to the front railing, and the pastor extends communion to them one by one. Now, up until that day, St. Paul's had always taken communion a certain way, and this was the certain way. Usually, white people would come to the altar and receive communion first, and then from the gallery, black people would come from their seats in the western gallery. And usually, white men, white women, then black men, black women, and that's how it had been served there at the St. Paul's Episcopal Church. But that day, Civil War was over, that day, a tall, well-dressed black man sitting in the Western Gallery came forward at the time of communion and knelt at the rail first. And everyone of both colors froze in their seats. They wondered, my goodness, what's going to happen next? And Pastor Charles was pretty froze up too. He looked around clearly not knowing what to do. Would you like to know what happened next? <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you at the end of the message. <laughs> um, but first, let me ask you a question. Why are you so angry? And are you right to be angry, or are you in sin most of the time when you're angry? After a couple of weeks off for Easter messages, we're back in Jesus, Christ, Jesus Christ's amazing Sermon on the Mount that's in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And in today's passage we see Jesus deal head on with our anger. So Matthew chapter 5, hopefully you've gotten there by now. And we're going to look at verses 21 through 26. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire, to hellfire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and they remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny, the heart of the matter. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love for us and the truth of your word. We thank you so much that you're in the business of saving sinners and transforming people who had walked in darkness into people that start walking in the light of your word. Lord, thank you for the fact that you are the author and finisher of our faith, that what you start, you pledge to see through, that you who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. I pray for every Christian here today as we go through this text. Lord, help us to go beyond just a sense that our faith gives us hell insurance to a full integration of your word into every area of our lives. Thank you for the relentless way in Matthew chapter 5 you give us one truth after another that gets beyond external obedience to internal followership and matters of the heart. Lord God, I pray for those here today, as Eddie's prayed already and thought already, I pray for those that don't know you that you're either watching online or here in the room. Lord God, I pray that you'll continue to draw them to yourself, 
that having sensed their need of you as a sinner, Lord, they'll turn to you as the Savior and be changed forever. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, we'll look first in verses 21 and 22 where we see we get to introduce one of Jesus' teaching formulas. So verse 21, look what it says there. You have heard that it was said to those of old, but I say to you. Now, in our last message, we saw Jesus call us to proper understanding of the Old Testament's teaching as it points us to faith in him. In the rest of chapter 5, Jesus teaches us what he means by six times using the form formula, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. Now, if you're holding a Bible that's got headings, in there it probably gives those headings at verse 21 as Jesus teaches about anger, in verse 27 as he teaches about lust, in verse 31 as he teaches about divorce, in verse 33 as he teaches about oaths, verse 38 as he teaches about retaliation, and verse 43 as he talks about even loving your enemies. Well, Jesus is a master teacher, and he made it easy to outline his sermon. And so as we're going through, at least in this part of the sermon, six different times as chapter 5 moves on, he says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. And in each case, we see something fundamentally different about Jesus' teaching and that of the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees, they focus their teaching on external obedience to God and his commands. But Jesus focused his lessons on internal obedience that comes from love for God from the heart. The internal leads to the external, and the internal needs to be worked on so it comes out in the external. So for Jesus, the heart of the matter was what? The matter of the heart. The heart of the matter was the matter of the heart. In none of what Jesus says in the rest of chapter 5 does he reject the beauty of Old Testament teachings. Last time we saw that every Thing it was set out to do, it would fulfill in, throughout the counsel of God, Old and New Testament alike. Jesus just focuses them on the why behind the what. An educator recently wrote a book, Start With Why. Make sure as you talk things through, you talk about the why behind the what. And that's going to be so important for you guys as you interact with those that don't know the Lord as you go forward. We could talk about all kinds of manner of sexual sin and the things that aren't God's will for people, and we do. But we need to be able to go back to Genesis 1 and 2 and say God created people male and female, and he brought them together in chapter 2, the man and the woman, to be husband and wife, and that's the only outlet that heaven sanctions for sexuality. The purpose of sexuality, the why of sexuality, is for bonding and procreation, the possibility of procreation within the marriage bond. And so you need to be able to do both, call specific things sin that are deviations from what God says, but to go back to the why behind the what. Josh McDowell understood this when he wrote Truth Matters. It was a tremendous teaching tool I used in youth ministry many years ago, and it's probably still out there somewhere. But he said, behind every precept is a principle based on God's person. A precept is a command, another word for command. A precept would be don't lie, do not lie. But there's a principle behind the precept. You're not supposed to lie because the principle is you and I need truth to have good relationships with each other. If a husband lies to his wife, a wife to her husband, or if I lie to a friend and my friend lies to me, it's going to fracture. It's going to create fractures in our relationship. We're going to have a hard time trusting one another. So the precept is don't lie. The principle behind it from God's word is that we need truth to have good relationships. But in every one of those, somehow it's rooted in the character of God. They're not as always as easy to tell, but you can cipher it out as you go. But um, for not lying and the necessity of truth comes the person of God. We know God is what? He's a God of truth who cannot lie, and he will always tell us the truth even when we don't want to hear it. He will tell us what's best for us, not what we... Uh, want to hear or act on apart from him. In Jesus' teaching in chapter 5, he is taking us beyond precept to principle in relationship with the person. Now, sometimes people will say something like this, the Pharisees' teaching was harder to obey than Jesus' teaching. Don't you believe it? Don't you believe it? The Pharisees had checklists that people could do 
And some people, even in our day, maybe some of you, love the fact that you can do a checklist without your heart being in it too much. Jesus takes you well beyond that. He makes you work by faith for it. Jesus makes his disciples work harder by faith than the Pharisees did because Jesus takes you beyond checklists of external obedience and makes you, as his follower, deal with root issues in your heart by faith. And if you don't, you remain stilted and childlike in your faith. Now, or childish in your faith. We are to have a childish faith, but not a, a child. We're supposed to have a childlike faith, but not a childish faith. I'll get it right. You can have a Pharisee spirit and not be dealing with what Jesus wants you to deal with. The Pharisee spirit can attend church nearly every Sunday while still ignoring his teaching most other days of the year at home and work. And so your church people come around, you come to think of you as a pretty good person, but you're a terrible spouse and you're a, a hard parent or you get to work and you're unethical and do this, but you'll be back in church next Sunday with your Pharisee spirit and people will go, oh, the pretty good guy. How do you know? Well, they come to church where I go to church. I'm a pretty good guy. They're a pretty good guy. We must all be pretty good guys. The Pharisee spirit can give 10% of your income to Jesus without giving him 100% of your heart. And here's all these scriptures that Jesus says, I want all of you. And then we can talk about proportional, generous, and sacrificial giving. The Pharisee spirit can pat itself on the back for external righteousness while inside being filled with hatred and lust, the kind of hatred that shows up in being, making racial statements and the kind of lust that shows up in having a secret addiction to pornography when um, you know, you, you, it's not helping you at all. Well, buckle your seatbelts for the Matthew 5 teachings of the Lord because he goes straight to the heart. And in verses 21 and 22, we see that heaven finds you and me guilty of a type of murder. Look again at verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Well, golly, that's the sixth command, and it must be obeyed. And almost everyone Jesus was talking to then, and I am talking to today, are in outward compliance. So pat yourself on the back if you've never murdered anybody. Oh, we're such good people. We've never murdered anybody. It's amazing how grace works, though, right? Paul was a murderer. Moses was a murderer, too. But they were forgiven. And they came to know the Lord. And God did great things in them after that. Hold on, because Jesus isn't done with us yet. Look at verse 22. He said, but I say to you. Say, but I say to you. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Now, did you catch the parallel there? Murderers are liable to judgment. What are angry people liable to? Judgment. So murder is worthy of judgment, liable to judgment. Hatred, angry hatred is liable to judgment. Well, Jesus' teaching leads us to conclude that sinful anger inside our hearts is the root problem behind outward acts of violence and murder, and that letting sinful anger go undealt with is already liable to heaven's judgment. What does that mean? Well, that means some people, according to Jesus, in this room have a big problem because we are ate up with sinful anger inside our hearts. And it grows and it grows and we lash out with angry words inside our homes and our schools and workplaces when we post on social media as we consider what the pagan politicians are doing when we watch sports games and other things. And that anger just spills out into angry and vitriolic words a lot of times. And here Jesus says that if that's you, you're already a type of murderer. And now you can see while it's easier to be a Pharisee than a follower of Jesus. Because they patted themselves on the back for externally not being murderers. And Jesus says, well, you look like a bunch of hateful, angry people to me. And so get that hand off your back because we got work to do. We got Holy Spirit work to do to have you be the kind of loving person in Christ that he wants you and I to be. Look at the next part of verse 22. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Now, in the Greek, Jesus specifically says, whoever calls his brother Raka, whoever calls his brother Raka will be liable to their Sanhedrin, their government council. When they said the word Raka, they were calling them empty head, something with nothing inside their head. You ever called somebody a nothing, a zero, an empty person? 
Inside their heart, they were thinking there was something inherently wrong with the other person, something that made them nothing in their eyes, less than them. And they spoke those words contemptuously. Jesus reminded his listeners that someone making public slanderous statements could actually go before the Sanhedrin for that hate speech, so to speak. But Jesus' next statement makes us understand that that is not their greatest problem. So he reminds them, if you're the kind of person that calls people slurs and thinks of them as less than you and thinks of them as empty or nothing, that you can be brought up for libel churches before some kind of government action. And we know our own government and governments around the world are starting to do that in increasingly ways that contain just talking about those that want to talk about free speech issues and stuff like that. So it's getting tighter and tighter. But the Sanhedrin, he says, you can be called before and charged for slander. But that's not your biggest problem, he says, because look what he says next. Verse 22, whoever says, you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Literally in the Greek, it's whoever calls a person a mora. When you hear mora, what do you think? Moron, right? That's the Greek word behind calling somebody a moron. Whoever calls another a moron will be liable to hell fire, Jesus says. So he says, you can call somebody a raka and get caught, brought up on slander charges, but there's a bigger problem for those of you who want to follow me, and that is... I say if you call somebody a moron, which is a lot like the word raka, if you call somebody that, then you've got judgment from God to worry about. This is the first time that Jesus compares hell to Gehenna, the place in Jerusalem they burned the garbage. So it, at Gehenna, they had fires going all the time. The fires never went out. You'd bring your garbage there and get burned up and that sort of thing. And the fires, they kept feeding and feeding with more garbage and other stuff. And so Jesus, for the first time here, says that's what eternal punishment is going to be like. In other places, he says there'll be darkness there and weeping and gnashing of teeth. But he compared it to this place that they didn't want to even think about. So he's essentially saying if you call another person garbage, you're the person who deserves judgment. Whew. My goodness. I don't know how many of you grew up in an angry home where you were called nothing all the time or people would curse at you and you'd curse back or just saying slanderous things about others was common and it happened all the time. Man, that was my life growing up, you know. We'd get cursed at, we'd curse back at our parents. We would curse at each other and get cursed back at. We, in our relationships at school, the same kind of thing was happening. I said incredibly mean and hurtful and slanderous things during those days. Uh, just to protect myself because other things were coming back at me like that. It hurt to receive those words and, in, and hurt people hurt people. So I was lashed out at, I'd lash out with others and that's the way my life was. And many of you grew up in a home like that. You grew up in a school like that. Others of you can't even understand that because your parents were so kind and loving and you need to be thankful for that gift you had. But I wonder, have you ever had enough anger inside of you that angry words just came out? Well, according to Jesus, you're as guilty as a murderer and need to repent. Have you ever cowered your spouse or children with angry outbursts, tough guy? According to Jesus, you're as guilty as a murderer and need to repent. Have you ever uttered a racist statement about someone else who God says he created in his image and likeness? You're as guilty as a murderer, Jesus says, and you need to repent. You say, okay, Pastor Danny, I get that, but what about all the truly evil things? Well, abuse and racism are pretty evil things. But what about all those truly evil things out there? You say, Pastor Danny, shouldn't I be angry about those things? Yes, there is such a thing as righteous anger. The Bible does say in Ephesians 4, 26, be angry and sin not, or be angry and don't sin. And Jesus perfectly modeled that when he overturned the money changers' tables at the temple. He said, this shouldn't be here in God's house. And with perfect righteous anger, he did something about it. Our problem is that even when we're right to be angry, we usually don't handle our anger in right ways. Can I get a witness? And because of our selfishness, many times when we felt our anger was justified, it really was not. It was just a sinful outburst. 
And you say, okay, Pastor Danny, I'm agreeing with you, but what do I do about it? Well, I'm glad you asked because Jesus illustrates what he teaches and he gives two examples, one in verses 23 and 24 and one in 25 and 26 of what we do with that sinful anger instead of um, going off and letting it out in unhealthy and unproductive and sinful ways. Look at verses 23 and 24. He said, so if you're offering your gift at the altar... And there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer that gift. Your gift. Whew, what is Jesus saying to us there? Verses 23 and 24. What he's saying to us is we need to put relationship mending ahead of even our church obligations. I just want to tell you guys, I'm so thankful for your faithful service at the tabernacle. We could never do all we do without the faithfulness of people in serving and volunteering and the positions that people fill. We, we need you. We need you, and we're grateful for you. Many times I've talked to other pastors, and they have a big crowd on Sunday mornings, but they don't have anybody working during the week, let alone outside the church walls as we're celebrating here. I'm so thankful for all that gets done in the name of Christ and that helps the church. And I'm so thankful for your faithful giving to the Lord's work. Here it refers to giving and the giving and bringing it to the altar and stuff. And, and we couldn't do what we do without your faithfulness and giving. And I'm so thankful for that. Last year we set a $90,000 a month budget and we brought in $100,000 a month on average and so it allowed us to not only do everything that was in the budget but also things beyond that with some upgrades and uh, still take in more than came out and uh, our investments grow for the future and for rainy days and things like that and this year be, last year we got some of our insurance numbers uh, off a little bit and so we had to uh, adjust the budget up five thousand it's ninety five thousand dollars of this a month this year and through three quarters you've met it You've met it. And thank you for your faithful giving. But some of you are in sin against the Lord. You zealously fulfill your church obligations, but your relationship is broken with someone close to you. And you're doing almost nothing about it. And you haven't been doing anything about it for some of you, not just days or weeks or months, but years and for some maybe decades. Let me zero in here. Think of the game Family Feud for a moment. Boy, that'll bring us back out of being a downer, won't it? <laughs> In Family Feud, what do they do? They ask a question, right? You know, there's this board behind them, and it's got the survey responses on it, but they're hidden. And they're going to turn it over, and then they're going to say, what percentage of respondents said that, right? And so in Family Feud, they ask you a question, and you need to guess what the number one answer is to a poll question. Sometimes someone answers a question, and the board turns over, and it says 60%. It says, ding, and 60% of respondents say, and it's the obvious thing that most of us would have said, and then it's going to be work to get fill in the others because the percentages are a lot less with those other things. The other answers will add up to that other 40%, even if there's seven answers on the board. In the spirit of family feud, I want to ask you, where's the number one place that verses 23 and 24 need to be applied? In the home. In the home. Whether you're single, whether you're um, single living with roommates, whether you're uh, married with children in the home or as empty nesters or whatever, Oftentimes, we will say things in home in a hateful way that we'd never say in our schools or our workplaces. Part of that's because we're comfortable there. We understand uh, the love we receive, but we take it for granted, and then we let things build up, and we lash out. And um, you may need to apply it at work or school. You may need to apply it with a fellow church member, a neighbor, or a teammate, but the number one place is probably the home. And I just wonder how you do in tabernacle marriages, tabernacle friendships, tabernacle roommate situations. How you doing? 
How are you doing with all that? What many of you need today is to go home and find a time and a place to talk with your spouse and humbly say, Honey, I put you through so much, and I am sorry. I am called to love my neighbor as myself, and you're my first neighbor. And yet here I do all kinds of other things, loving people in the name of the Lord as I go to work and as I go to school and as I go to church, and yet at home you get ice from me. And your spouse gets more love from the dog wagging the tail when she gets home than she gets from you. Start wagging your tail a little bit more and close your mouth with the barks a little more. <laughs> Act like you like each other. Remember why you love each other. Remember why God put you together. And where you need to say, please forgive me for being unselfish and, um, and inconsiderate and all those things. Take the time to do that. First, get things right at home. And if you need to, if you're doing four things in the church and need to drop back to two, hey, we can adjust. We can adjust so that you can take care of what needs to be taken care of at home. Jesus applies these words first right here. Deal with that and love your spouse. I'm seeing some dear widows and widowers out here that had such great relationships with their spouses. And boy, they wish they could spend more time with their spouse. Why don't you do that before it's too late? I'm reading a book, Get Married. Uh, it's by Brad Wilcox, the great sociologist that's up at the University of Virginia. And he gives amazing research. And he says, you know what? Uh, if you're married, you have a greater prospect of happiness uh, when you're getting up into your 50s and 60s and things like that than a person that has a good degree, has a big income. And he mentioned one other thing, too. And, and that was ahead, marriage of any kind was ahead of any of those other indicators. But a happy marriage was 500% more likely to be a person that was happy. You have every reason to invest in your own happiness by reinvesting in your marriage, saying no to some things so you can do other things right and get those to a healthy place. Now, up here, if you want to after the service... I noticed something when I was doing marriage counseling a few years back. I noticed that there were some things that just weren't happening when couples were in crisis. And I'm not saying I'm great at these. I need to get the sheet myself. But I've got a sheet up here called 20, success, 20 Things Successful Couples Do. And you can grab that and look through it and use it. When a couple was in crisis, they weren't doing any of them. And so I took that and started giving it out when I do premarital counseling also because I said, here's where it's going to be at, guys. Look at these things. And it's not the best thing any Christian counselor ever put out. It's just Danny's thing, you know, and has been helpful to me and some others. I also put up here, remember last week, Elizabeth's words at the end of the service, weren't those good coming out of her personal time with the Lord? Uh, there's a copy of those up here, too, if you want to get her reflections on who are you and the love that God has so intensely for you. <laughs> Maybe what needs to happen for some of you with your spouse also needs to happen with your children or children toward your parents. You have seen other children uh, acting snottily toward their parents and saying awful things, and you've gotten in a habit of underappreciating your parents and saying hard things to them. And uh, you need to repent of that and say you're sorry and rework at it with the simple things the Scripture says will help in your relationships. Maybe it needs to happen with someone who sits on this side of the room and someone who's in the balcony or vice versa or any number of combinations there. Maybe it needs to happen with someone that you work with. So in verses 23 and 24, Jesus tells us to put relationship mending ahead of even your church obligations. And the second thing he tells us there is in verses 25 and 26. Look at it there. In your text, he says, Come to terms quickly with your accuser. Some translations might say adversary. While you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you'll never get out until you have paid the last penny. Well, what is Jesus telling us to do there? He's telling us to resolve conflict as soon as possible, ASAP, before the consequences get worse. Every once in a while, I tell you there's a, a word you might consider underlining or circling in your text. The key word in these two verses is the word quickly. Quickly. 
Ephesians 4.26 says, be angry and do not sin. The second part of that verse says, and do not let the sun go down on your anger, on your wrath. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, on your wrath. You've got to think of that through a minute. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Well, um, in their day, sun was usually meant the end of the day, the day you weren't out, you were in, and the day you were pro- the time it, you were starting to think about going toward uh, bed. So when, Jesus, when uh, the Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, don't let the sun go down on your anger, what's he saying? He's saying, deal with your anger issue with somebody else, the conflict you have, before the end of the day. You say, Danny, I'd rather listen to that country song where the lady says, I just want to be mad for a while. (laughs) Problem is, when we're mad and don't resolve conflict, what are we doing? We're giving the devil a foothold. And once the devil gets the foothold, he wants to get more in. He wants to gain entry. And some believers even have strongholds in their life because they initially gave the devil a foothold, didn't practice Christian principles, and now Satan has a command post, not from within them. Christians aren't demon-possessed. But uh, you're, you're, you're being in the flesh and carnal rather than doing things biblically and through the Holy Spirit have created a stronghold area of command posts in your life where Satan can get you to increasingly disobey God in other areas too. And the Pharisees had lots of those. So later in Matthew's gospel, we see a chapter where the most woes of any chapter in the Bible, more than the prophets are given, and it's Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, and he's saying, hey, you dress up, you look good on the outside, but inside it's like dead men's bones. You're like a pretty casket on the outside, but inside is death. And he says, that's what you're like, Pharisees. There's external checklists that you're obeying, but inside there's hatred in your heart that's undealt with and some of these other things that you're letting go by and by. And Satan has more control in your life than you realize. And you've got you've to free yourself from that grasp before he continues to cause damage for years to come in your life. We tend to wait to address relational problems, and they only get worse. This verse teaches us to try and clear up relational conflicts before the end of the day. Now, back in Matthew 5, 26, the last part there is a reference to debtor's prisons. You're familiar with the concept of debtor's prisons. We usually think about them as an English thing later, but they were true in the Roman Empire too, where if you had a debt, you had to get in there and do some kind of work until it was paid off and you weren't getting out until you paid the last bit off. Now, this is not... a reference to purgatory. Catholics might teach that, but what it really is, it's Jesus giving us a powerful illustration of the reap what you sow principle. And as a pastor, I've seen this truth so many times for people. They're not dealing with the internal heart things. They're putting on facades and, you know, masks and stuff and going out and fulfilling all their church obligations and things. Folks, if you hold on to anger and don't try to restore broken relationships proactively, it will continue to cost dearly, cost you dearly. It'll affect your spiritual health, your physical health, your emotional health, even your financial health. And the Lord wants to free you from all of that so you can be free at last, free indeed. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. But it's not going to happen if you play games and you're content to do the external checklist things without constantly letting the Holy Spirit work on your heart and go to others you've wronged and work out things with them and be humble. Prefer others before yourself even as you prefer the Lord before yourself. Now this doesn't mean we aren't going to have conflicts with people. Jesus told his disciples they would have all kinds of trouble in the world, even dislike and hate from others. The key is that you're freeing yourself by doing your part when there's such things that are true. Some things are not going to get fully resolved, but we can agree to disagree on some matters and still agree in the Lord, as those two ladies were asked to do in Philippians chapter 4. Remember that context there? Uh, Paul writes to the pastor there in Philippi. His name is Sisygos, if you take the Greek word true companion to mean the man's name, Sisygos. I think that was his name. And he says, help these ladies who have done so much in the cause of Christ 
No doubt they were both Christians. They loved the Lord, and yet they had a fallen out. One had called the other grandchild, other's grandchild ugly or something, and they had, they had gotten in a, such a tiff that one was on one side of the church, one was on the other. And think about being in a house church that could hold about 60, and one lady over here mad at another lady over here, and they're just the whole thing is tense in the room because of that. That's not resolved and stuff. And Paul said, stop letting time pass, as it goes. Bring those ladies together. And get them to agree in the Lord. To agree in the Lord. And so you can agree in the Lord even when you disagree about stuff that doesn't matter. My goodness, we've got Carolina and Duke and state fans here all together and things. And you think your team's the greatest. And you disagree about that, but you agree in the Lord. And we've got people here that think a little bit about this, think a little bit about that. And, and you can agree in the Lord when you disagree about secondary and tertiary and other matters like that. Uh, I've, I, I, I remember this being true for when I was uh, the youth pastor at uh, Wayne Hills Baptist Church up in Waynesboro. And our pastor was called to Texas and he wanted me to come down with him and be his youth pastor there. I didn't feel called to go. And that created some hard feelings and he thought maybe I said some things I shouldn't have in those, uh, uh, you know, Long story short, he didn't think I should become the next pastor, but I wound up becoming the next pastor. And the week they voted me in, he came by the office and told me why he didn't think I should be the next pastor. Now, you tell you what I did. I was hurt. But I also said, he just mentioned three things to me that I'm going to watch out for my, in my own life the rest of my life. I think I told Elizabeth what they were. These are the kind of things we're going to watch out for because it's uncomfortably close to the truth and there is truth in what he says. But I think I still should be the pastor and the Lord was leading that way. I wound up becoming the pastor. So we had a disagreement between us. Brothers in Christ, brother pastors now, a disagreement, in, a disagreement about that. And I remember a few months passed, and I was grieving because I wanted to see him at the Southern Baptist Convention and be able to sit down with him and ask him how it was going and tell him how things were going at Wayne Hills. I wanted to have him back to speak. And so one day I just called him up and I said, Brother, can we just agree to disagree about whether I should have been the pastor or not? Can we just set that to the side and think about all we agree on in the Lord? We love this Lord. We love the gospel. We love this church. And he paused and said, Danny, I would like that. And we had that beautiful, restored friendship. He did come to speak. He blessed the church. He spoke there recently. And we've seen each other at conventions and other things, and I admire him. In many ways, all the doubling of attendance and all that stuff that happened at Wayne Hills during those magical years uh, was... It happened while I was leading, but because of his prayers. Twice he had fasted 40 days for revival and growth in our church and to get the relocation done. And all those things wound up happening under my leadership, but the prayers were what propelled it. And I admire and I'm thankful about that. Don't burn your bridges. It's a little different when abuse has been involved. You need to get some counseling somehow about exactly what kind of relationship or non-relationship you'll have, but you still need to work through the forgiveness issues and those things. Here's some practical tips for dealing with anger. There's so much we could say, but let's just say a few here. First of all, you've got to be growing in your relationship with God, your triune God. That's the only way you'll have the spiritual resources to overcome sinful anger. Some of you are in the flesh all the time because you're in the flesh all the time. You, you never take that time to come apart and spend time with the Lord in, in Bible reading and prayer. Uh, you, you don't do your part to develop good friendships with others in a spiritual way and practice spiritual things. You're never going to be able to deal with your anger if you don't have the spiritual resources that come by knowing how much God has forgiven you, that you're growing in relationship with him, your time of praise and prayer to him. All those things give you the spiritual mindset you need to be able to work through things with people. Secondly, when you feel angry, pause. Count to three and quote to yourself James 1, 19 and 20. What does it say? It says, know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person 
Be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of Dan does not produce the righteousness of God. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, so somebody makes you angry. Instead of lashing right back out, protecting your turf, protecting your image, protecting your sense of hurt there, you, you want to you pause and you want to count to three. And if you can get good at it, what you'll do is instead of saying one, two, three, you'll say to yourself, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And you'll remember that last verse there too about my angry response in the flesh is not going to produce any of the righteousness of God in this moment. Well, the third thing is you want to pray about the underlining spiritual things going on in people's lives. We're all like onions with layers that get peeled back. Sometimes somebody lashes out at you and you don't know what happened to them in their home earlier that day. I saw it as a youth pastor. I've seen it as a pastor so many times. You go, when you, when you get the rest of the story, you go, oh, they just had a death in the family. That's why they're short right here and yelling. And what they're really doing is it's grief squirting out a different direction. And I should have known that, you know, rather than just be hurt because they said something ugly to me during that time. So you want to think about that. Remember Ephesians 6, it says, our battle is not against people. It's for people. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. You are for people. You want them to experience God in their lives, every one of them, and you're praying for that. And you also want to realize that lost people act lost because they're lost. There's a spiritual battle going on, and the devil has control of everybody that hasn't turned to Christ yet. And so, of course, they're going to say things lost people say. Of course, they're going to do things lost people do. And you're called to love them anyway. And they're going to say some things. You know, the great evangelist Ray Comfort, you know, that does street evangelism and stuff, he says, listen, a lot of people, when they start to go out on the streets or into a park and start talking, they get a heckler, and they think, oh, no, somebody's heckling me. He says, that's the greatest thing ever, because when somebody starts heckling you, others come and draw near in a crowd. And if you respond in a Christ-like way there and answer just enough of their question to get it back on track, and you don't preach in parks, most of you, but as you talk to individuals, they're going to say ugly things to you. They're going to heckle you. And you just have to pray and love and respond. Say, well, I don't really, that's a, you bring up a good point. I haven't thought of that before. Let me uh, see if I can get an answer and get back to you on that. But have you considered this? And you're having a dialogue, not just these angry monologues. And that's the problem with so much online posting. It's one way, just hate coming at you, right? But pray about those underlining spiritual things. And then be proactive as God leads you. Are you angry about politics? Don't just rant. Send a check to a candidate you support. Get ready to vote. Um, if, are you angry about abortion? Make a gift to the local pregnancy help center. Consider being a foster parent. What's a proactive way you can help in the area that's got you angry? And there is a righteous anger there. I did one earlier. I wanted to inform you that I believe our government is, is taking actions that will, will hurt us in relationship to the nation of Israel. And so I use literally the pulpit I have to share that I think that's a grave mistake. I didn't do that in anger and, and frustration. I'm doing that in a spirit of prayer and love and hope that uh, it'll help you as you have conversations with people about Israel's right to existence, right to defend itself, and some underlying spiritual things about that that go all the way back to Old Testament early verses. So be proactive as God leads you, and then react with God's grace rather than nurse resentments. Another situation I had when I was a, a senior in college, I was a very busy student. I was captain of the soccer team. We made it to the nationals again that year. Had a lot going on. And um, I was also an RA getting paid to watch over other students in the dorm and stuff like that. And I was president of Practical Christian Involvement. It was a ministry that had two-thirds of the student body doing something during the week, like these candles, to reach out in the communities. We did tutoring and teaching the Bible in public schools and all kinds of neat stuff. It's a great ministry. What did it mean to be the... Uh, what did it mean to be the president of Practical Christian Involvement? For all intents and purposes, it meant being the promoter cheerleader of Practical Christian Involvement. It meant with my smile and my leadership abilities, I was to make it seem like something everybody would want to do. And I did that. Um, we had a 
Christian education professor, and his wife was over the ministry of practical Christian involvement. So she did all the nuts and bolts things. And one time I was walking into the president, uh, president's, uh, the, I'm sorry, the leader's office for practical Christian involvement, and as I'm rounding the corner, I just kind of stop because there's a fella in there. He kind of served as a uh, secretary for the ministry. Uh, you get paid a, you know, student money for school and uh, financial aid. You know, he was in there as a secretary to the PCI director, and there were two or three girls in there he was trying to impress, and he was running his mouth and saying, well, Danny Campbell's just a figurehead. You know, he doesn't really do anything to make practical Christian involvement go. He's more of a figurehead. And I thought this would be a good time to walk in the room. <laughs> and I did. And he saw me. I've never seen a fella's face turn so white. <laughs> My goodness, he was blank as a sheet. And the girls, they got as quick as they could. They, made, they were out of there, you know. And I said, Tim, how are you? And he said, okay. And I said, I heard what you just said, and he's like, oh, no, and he started to get apologetic. I said, listen, Tim, what you said is largely true, and I know that. This ministry is run by Sharon Richardson, and she does a great job with that, and the whole point of being the president is to be a cheerleader for it and a promoter of it. I understand that. But I said, Tim, is there any possible good that can come by what you just told those girls? Don't know what your motivation was, but that's not going to make them think better of PCI or of you or anything else. And uh, he apologized again, and I accepted his apology. And my gentle answer turned away wrath like the proverb says. And every once in a while, I still interact with that guy sometimes online or whatever. And I think that helped him in his own spiritual journey. I don't know. Um, but it certainly wouldn't have done me any good to blast him there um, React with God's grace rather than nurse resentments. And that brings us back to St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Richmond in the spring of 1865 after the Civil War. You'll recall that at the time of communion, an elderly black man went to the front rail to receive communion, and no one knew what to do, even the pastor. The moment was incredibly uncomfortable. At that moment, after what seemed like forever, but it was just a few seconds, one of the church's most distinguished members, who was an older white man with snow white hair and a gray beard, he had spent the last four years fighting for the Confederacy in the war and had been there at the Appomattox surrender. When everyone else didn't know what to do, this gentleman soldier got up, walked the aisle, and knelt beside the black man at the altar. And because of his stature, Everyone else took a deep breath, and black people and white people did what they had never done before. They came down to the altar together for communion. That white man was General Robert E. Lee, who was ready to show by example that a new day had come. I sure wish when they started making statues, they had made a statue of that moment. That's what the statue should have been made of. And I hope that me and you are living statues of that kind of love and putting Christ first and making a difference in the world above everything else. Will you bow your heads?